present truth. True love is always an answer to the need. For some teaching to be from God, it is not enough to be true, in harmony with the Bible, but to be a response to the temptations that people have. God has always had his church, which by its teaching is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3.15, because with its light it represents a response to the temptations of the people of its time. In the time of Martin Luther, the main temptation of Catholics was justification by works and the use of indulgences, so God raised Luther to respond to the needs of the moment through him. Had Martin Luther preached to the Catholics the message of the prophet Jonah, yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown, he would only have led them to greater fanaticism. Catholics would give larger sums of money to priests and repeat Ave Maria more times a day. But Luther preached what was the right answer to the temptation of these people. The doctrine of justification by faith also rebuking the false doctrine. And had the prophet Jonah say preached to the Ninevites the message, God loves you, salvation is by faith without works of the law. None of them would repent of their iniquities, but would find an excuse for their iniquities in such a message. The Ninevites would agree with the idea that God is love, but they would understand it as an excuse for impenitence. Such is the temptation of the people of this time. For we can truly say that the time has come to which Jesus referred as the time of iniquity when the love of many grew cold. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Matthew 24:12. To those who live lawlessly, Preaching the truth of the cross as the main message means giving them an excuse for even greater lawlessness, as Martin Luther once remarked. The ungodly out of the gospel suck only a carnal freedom and become worse thereby, therefore, not the gospel, but the law belongs to them. Even as when my little son John offends, if then I should not whip him, but call him to the table to me and give him sugar plums, thereby I should make him worse, yea quite spoil him. The table talk of Martin Luther. For those who openly break the law, the cure is an open rebuke for lawlessness, otherwise they will not become aware of their soul's need for God. That is why the questions naturally arise. Which church preaches to this world that lives in prophesied lawlessness the significance of God's neglected law? Which church in this time of hedonism, with its doctrine of healthy eating, rebukes the intemperance and viciousness of modern hedonists? Which church to the careless ones who say, My master is delaying his coming, Matthew twenty four forty eight, brings rebuke about the imminent coming of God's judgment? So which church, with its present truth, is the right answer to the temptation of today? There is only one church that is the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3.15, precisely because by its teaching it represents a response to the temptation that people have today. Those who today lull their consciences with the words, My master is delaying his coming, Matthew 24.48. This church warns, Fear God and give glory to him, Revelation 14.7. To those who live in lawlessness, its doctrine brings out the truth about the importance and depth of the requirements of God's law. For those who live in the temptation of hedonism, this doctrine sets out the principles of a healthy diet and the principles of intemperance. Those who live today in Babylon, which is a group of apostate churches that by their false teachings have become a danger to sincere believers, God is calling to come out of their communities with clarification, that ye receive not of her plagues, Revelation 18.4, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, Revelation 14.8. I know that only the Adventist church, with its doctrine, represents a response to the temptations of this time. The Adventist church also knows the gift of prophecy as a feature of the end-time church, because this gift is necessary to her due to the specific temptations of the end-time. The Adventist Church recognized this gift in the work of the Adventist prophet Ellen G. White. What are the new temptations due to which we need the gift of Ellen G. White today, and which were not so common in history before that only now we would need a new light 
to respond to these special temptations of the end times? What temptations do we immediately notice in the worship services of the evangelical Christians? These are seducing believers with sentiment and suffocating the conscience with fun, excessive mutual closeness in which believers seek satisfaction, neglected requirements of God's law, advocating that the Ten Commandments are a yoke of slavery and that they have been abolished on the cross, a misconception of the notion of true love and conversion of heart, seeking evidence of communion with God in signs, wonders, and false spiritual gifts, shifting one's own responsibility of choice to God, and intoxicating with music. These delusions are the temptation of Babylon today, and in the work of Ellen G. White we find a clear answer to these temptations. Ellen G. White exposes the wrong function of feelings. When self is submerged in Christ, true love springs forth spontaneously. It is not an emotion or an impulse, but a decision of a sanctified will. It consists not in feeling, but in the transformation of the whole heart, soul, and character, which is dead to self and alive unto God. Letter 97, 1898 Many precious souls, desiring earnestly to be Christians, are yet stumbling in darkness, waiting for their feelings to be powerfully exercised. They look for a special change to take place in their feelings. They expect some irresistible force, over which they have no control, to overpower them. They overlook the fact that the believer in Christ is to work out his salvation with fear and trembling. Miss 55, 1910 Many who speak to others of the need of a new heart do not themselves know what is meant by these words. The youth especially stumble over this phrase, a new heart. They do not know what it means. They look for a special change to take place in their feelings. This they term conversion. Over this error, thousands have stumbled to ruin, not understanding the expression, ye must be born again. Satan leads people to think that because they have felt a rapture of feeling, they are converted. But their experience does not change. Their actions are the same as before. Their lives show no good fruit. They pray often and long, and are constantly referring to the feelings they had at such and such a time. But they do not live the new life. They are deceived. Their experience goes no deeper than feeling. They build upon the sand, and when adverse winds come, their house is swept away. MYP 71.2 Ellen G. White criticizes sermons that evoke feelings by which a man intoxicates and stifles the need for God. The minister may think that with his fanciful eloquence, he has done great things in feeding the flock of God. The hearers may suppose that they never before heard such beautiful themes. They have never seen the truth dressed up in such beautiful language, and as God was represented before them in his greatness, they felt a glow of emotion. But trace from cause to effect all this ecstasy of feeling caused by these fanciful representations. There may be truths, but too often they are not the food that will fortify them for the daily battles of life. Miz 59, 1900, par 56. The feelings and sympathies of the people were stirred, but their consciences were not convicted, their hearts were not broken and humbled before God. 3T 2.17.4 Do not think that sentimentalism is religion. Shake yourselves from every human prop and lean heavily upon Christ. HS 137.5 Ellen G. White predicts false revivals. Popular revivals are too often carried by appeals to the imagination, by exciting the emotions, by gratifying the love for what is new and startling. Converts thus gained have little desire to listen to Bible truth, little interest in the testimony of prophets and apostles. Unless a religious service has something of a sensational character, it has no attractions for them. A message which appeals to unimpassioned reason awakens no response. The plain warnings of God's word, relating directly to their eternal interests, are unheeded. In those churches which he, Satan, can bring under his deceptive power, he will make it appear that God's special blessing is poured out. There will be manifest what is thought to be great religious interest. 
multitudes will exult that God is working marvelously for them when the work is that of another spirit. Under a religious guise, Satan will seek to extend his influence over the Christian world. There is an emotional excitement, a mingling of the true with the false, that is well adapted to mislead. GC 463-464 Satan declared that it was impossible for the sons and daughters of Adam to keep the law of God. Men who are under the control of Satan repeat these accusations against God in asserting that men cannot keep the law of God. ST January 16, 1896, Parameter 2 Ellen White criticizes entertainment and abuse of music. Amusements excite the mind, but depression is sure to follow. H.R. March 1, 1872, Parm 5. Satan will make music a snare by the way in which it is conducted. Letter 132, 1900. They have a keen ear for music, and Satan knows what organs to excite to animate, engross, and charm the mind so that Christ is not desired. Music, when not abused, is a great blessing. But when put to a wrong use, it is a terrible curse. It excites, but does not impart that strength and courage which the Christian can find only at the throne of grace, while humbly making known his wants, and with strong cries and tears, pleading for heavenly strength to be fortified against the powerful temptations of the evil one. Satan is leading the young captive. Oh, what can I say to lead them to break his power of infatuation? He is a skillful charmer, luring them on to perdition. I saw that Satan had blinded the minds of the youth that they could not comprehend the truths of God's word. 1 T 496-497 There will be shouting with drums, music, and dancing. The senses of rational beings will become so confused that they cannot be trusted to make right decisions. And this is called the moving of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit never reveals itself in such methods, in such a bedlam of noise. This is an invention of Satan to cover up his ingenious methods for making of none, effect the pure, sincere, elevating, ennobling, sanctifying truth for this time. Men became excited and were worked by the power thought to be the power of God. Latin 132, 1900, par 22, 23 to 25. Ellen G. White reveals the spirit of the law that the motives of the heart are essential. It is not the great results we attain, but the motives from which we act that weigh with God. He prizes goodness and faithfulness more than the greatness of the work accomplished. 2T 510.2 Many acts which pass for good works, even deeds of benevolence, will, when closely investigated, be found to be prompted by wrong motives. 2T 511.2 The Apostle enforces the duty of giving from higher grounds than merely human sympathy because the feelings are moved. He enforces the principle that we should labor unselfishly with an eye single to the glory of God. 3T 391 3. You must watch, you must pray, you must meditate, you must investigate your motives and your actions. 2T 564.2. Ellen G. White reveals the purpose of troubles. God sends trials to prove who will stand faithful under temptation. He brings all into trying positions to see if they will trust in a power out of and above themselves. Everyone has undiscovered traits of character that must come to light through trial. God allows those who are self-sufficient to be sorely tempted that they may understand their helplessness. 72.10.3 These quotes by Ellen G. White reveal the greatest possible light that God has given to any church at this time. Some evangelical Christians have replied to such quotations that they mean nothing to them even though they are a response to their temptations, because only the Scriptures are their authority and not Ellen G. White. I tell them that Ellen G. White is not an authority for me either, but the Holy Scriptures. But Ellen G. White is the greatest light, or in other words, the greatest explanation of the truth for this time. What is the greater authority in Scriptures? 
Is it when God writes the Ten Commandments on stone tablets or when Moses explains them? God is the greater authority when he says in the Decalogue, Thou shalt not commit adultery, Exodus 20.14. But Moses gives greater light when he explains that God's law looks at the very motives of the heart. That ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which ye use to go a whoring, Numbers 15.39. While God writes on the tablets, Thou shalt not kill, Exodus 20.13, Moses explains the meaning of that commandment. You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people. But you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Leviticus 19.16, 18. So, although the light revealed through the words of Moses is greater, it is in accordance with the commandments of the Decalogue and represents, in fact, only a clearer and greater explanation of the Decalogue, but not a greater authority than God's words. The purpose of preachers and prophets is to give greater explanations of the truth, adequate to the specific temptations of those to whom they convey the message, but this does not mean that these explanations are greater authority, although they are a greater light of explanation, so they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. Nehemiah 8.8. 8. Likewise, Jesus Christ was a greater light for people when he was on earth, but he always referred to the Old Testament as the authority of truth. On one occasion, after his resurrection, he hid from his disciples on the road to Emmaus that he was the Christ because he wanted his disciples, on the basis of the scriptures and not on the basis of his appearance, to come alone to the conclusion that he should have died for the sins of the world and rise from the dead. Then he said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things, and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And their eyes were opened, and they knew him. Luke 24, 25, 31. Note that the authority of the Old Testament is a greater authority than someone who would rise from the dead. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Luke 16, 30, 31. Likewise the apostles themselves, although proclaiming the gospel in words that are greater light and clearer explanation of the truth than the truth revealed in Old Testament times, do not regard the New Testament as greater authority of truth than the books of the Old Testament. So thus they praise those believers who, by the scriptures of the Old Testament, check the truthfulness of what they themselves preach to them. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Acts 17.11 One of Ellen White's greatest and most cunning critics is Adventist preacher and author George R. Knight. As Ellen White sheds special light in response to temptations that were not so widespread in biblical times and are therefore not specifically addressed in the Bible, George R. Knight argues that those issues the Bible does not deal with are not important, and therefore we should not quote Ellen White about those issues. So, since the intoxication by emotions, abuse of music and parapsychological phenomena, and many modern delusions were not the topic of the biblical prophets, we should not, according to George R. Knight, consider them important even today, to warn about them through the texts of Ellen White. However, Precisely because every age in history has its own trials, there is also a special message for every age that is adequate to the trials of that age. Ellen White writes, Different periods in the history of the Church have each been marked by the development of some special truth, adapted to the necessities of God's people at that time. Every new truth has made its way against hatred and opposition. Those who were blessed with its light were tempted and tried. EGW GC 609.1 Moods for greater and natural light did not cease with the departure of the apostles, 
but were predicted as a special characteristic of the last days, due to extremely difficult and cunning temptations. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my Spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Joel 2.28.31 So the writings of Ellen G. White are given today in accordance with God's promise in Joel 2.28. 29 is the greatest light for this time, but Scripture has always been and remained the greatest authority of the truthfulness of any revelation, whether it is from God or not.